I remember when I first watched, um, what was it, Don Wall? Yeah. Blew yeah. my mind. <sighs> Tommy Caldwell probably has one of the craziest stories. It's insane. In any sport. I mean, this guy's stories are insane. From how he was raised with his dad to what happened to him in, uh, what country was that that it was in? Uzbekistan? Kyr- no. Or Kyrgyzstan. Kyrgyzstan. Oh, Kyrgyzstan. Kyrgyzstan. Yeah. That was crazy. Um, and then, of course, how he almost ended his uh, rock climbing career and then the, that he became the first person ever to climb the smooth side of El Capitan. Yeah. Insane story. I mean, he's for sure one of the guys responsible for really putting rock climbing on the map for the average person. Like, I don't know, I don't know anybody that was talking about rock climbing uh, before, you know, Valley Uprising, Solo, I think Maru's the other one, and then and then Don Wall. Like mm-hmm. all all those documentaries came out like within a, a year or two of each other, and and what and just and he Tommy talks about this like you they didn't realize no one realized the popularity of it. Yeah. They didn't mm-hmm. think that it was going to be something you know like to his point too. It was so one of those, compelling though. Oh, it's unbelievably compelling. Well, and when you read Rise of Superman, Rise of Superman talks a lot about rock climbers and skydivers and guys that are into this because of flow state. It's like mm-hmm. one of the most ultimate places to chase flow because mm-hmm. you're in this place super high stakes yeah super high stakes and so it was cool that we got to talk about that a little bit in this uh this was a his fl- life experiences oh, on top of it bro his, oh, yeah. you could you said it to him best after the interview when we were so talking much to adversity. him so i was like dude you literally could have made like three movies about your life oh you know? like, and you'll hear easily. in this interview in this interview there's at least there's there's like three events that each one of them is compelling enough to be a movie. Do you know we didn't even touch on like yeah. what kicked off his career? Like so he when yeah. he was 14 years old, he won Snowbird, which in the rock climbing world is like one of the most prestigious like climbing events that you can. Right. And he was a little 14 year 14. old. 14. Yeah, and his dad's and his dad's videotaping him while he's doing it like that's like what kicked all of it off. So this dude's life has been insane. He's a badass. It's funny yep. too cuz we were looking at his hands after he's the interview. He's a really good guy. And he's got like these just these calloused fingertips and these feet. I mean he, you could tell this guy climbs rocks for a living. Anyway, you're going to love uh, this episode. He's currently um, promoting a new film, I believe, called The Real Rock 14. And this is about him and his partner Alex uh, Honnold speed climbing the nose of El Capitan. So the idea is to try to climb that in under two hours. I think that was like the record or yes. whatever. Yeah. Uh, so that's, I can't wait to watch that. Um, he also wrote a book called The Push. I believe this book is about uh, when he was held captive by terrorists um, when he was 21 years old on a rock climbing expedition. He tells that whole story uh, in this podcast you're about to listen to. Yeah. Um, you can find him on Instagram at Tommy Caldwell. Caldwell is spelled... C-A-L-D-W-E-L-L. Um, and then the bill that he's advocating for to protect the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge from drilling, because now he's an environmentalist, uh, is HR1146. So if, when you listen to this episode, if you, fi- if you find yourself moved uh, to donate or contribute or just help support uh, what he's talking about, that's the bill that he's talking about. Um, also, before we get started with the episode, I want to remind everybody... This month, it's Maps Starter that's on sale. It's 50% off. Maps Starter is a great program to get you started with fitness with weights. So if you haven't worked out with weights for a long time or you never have, this is the perfect program to get you going. It's a great program to gift to other people. So if you're a fitness fanatic and you want to get somebody to start lifting weights, uh, but you don't, you know, you know it takes a lot of time, they're beginners or whatever, it's the perfect program. It comes with video demos and uh, blueprints. It gives them everything that they need. They need minimal equipment. All you need are dumbbells and a physio ball. Um, personal trainers. For your beginner clients, this is a very valuable tool. So again, Map Starter, 50% off. Here's how you get the discount. Go to mapsstarter.com. That's M-A-P-S-S-T-A-R-T-E-R.com and use the code STARTER50. S-T-A-R-T-E-R-5-0, no space, for the discount. You actually already sound different. I can tell that you've you've done a ton of interviews now. Yeah, uh, can, really. You just, yeah, you sound way more like. The, I remember the first time I watched Don Wall. Like I felt like you. It was probably a little nerve wracking having all the cameras probably in your face, where you seem like you're way more comfortable already. Huh? Yeah, maybe. I mean, the the weird thing about being interviewed by for the Don Wall is I was being interviewed by like my best friends though. Oh, really? Um, oh, wow! Yeah. I would have never guessed that. Yeah, I mean, even movies like Free Solo, those are just made by 
your friends. And you think, I mean, that's what everybody thinks. They think that these movies have some big camera crew that comes in and you don't know them and it's this weird thing being yeah. filmed. But as a professional climber, that's you kind of make friends with because there's only a handful of people that can film on the I was going to say, <laughs> I guess that makes and sense. And they're climbers themselves. So, so do you sell uh, the content to like a production company at that point? No, it's they do it all. They it's just do like all. they are the production company. Oh, they're I the see. filmers, they're the production company, they're climbers, they're well, all in one. So awesome. how does something like that then get picked up by Netflix? Like how did that how did that all did you guys when you were doing it, well did you know it was gonna go to Netflix? No, definitely not. I mean, usually it's like when we were young, we were climbing, one of the climbers decided one day to pick up a camera. You know, then he just then they figured out that making videos was kind of cool. So they started making these grassroots videos and then they you know, eventually grew into these big production companies that create very unique content because climbing footage is, you know, just hard to get. Like I said, there's not that many people that can, they can film from yeah, the side how, of a wall. Yeah. How many people yeah. can film and climb I know. to be able to catch that you? That is you know? a skill. Yeah. There's like 10. You know? <laughs> <It's> <laughs> exactly. And, and it's so when we're climbing, we do help them though. It's like, we're working together. We fix ropes. They ascend the ropes. They don't actually have to climb the rock on those mm. faces the same way we do. They either hike to the top with a bunch of rope or they, where we fix ropes for them and they attach Jumars, but still you're living on the side of the wall you've got this heavy camera equipment and sound stuff and it's just not it's not a studio type environment at all so making high quality foot footage is really really hard to do up there and um yeah there's only a handful of do you know how much do you know how much footage they had to shoot in order to kill like for example the clip uh where your partner is trying to scale what is it the peak 15 was it 15 when he's trying to get across and it took him for all day oh, long oh yeah pitch 15. or pitch 15 it took yeah. him forever to get across that how much footage did they have to shoot before they finally caught him actually getting across I mean, so we worked on the Don Wall for seven years. Kevin, six, me, seven. And um, I had worked on it for like almost a year before there was a film crew involved at all. Hmm. Um, but then I gave up on the climb altogether. And then what actually got me back on the project was my good buddy, Josh Lowell, who owns Big Up Productions, was like, if you're not going to do this climb, we should make a little film clip about this and put it out there to the next generation because we feel like this climb is the future of this type of climbing so i went back up there with josh and a few friends we shot a video um and having my friends up there kind of got me recyced about it mm. and then that's how kevin jorgensen got involved because he saw that video and he called me up he's like hey man you want to <laughs> you want to go back there and <laughs> wow. show me how to do this and so from that point on it was a it was a documentary film project so kevin and i would spend two to three months a year on the wall um or in yosemite climbing on the wall and usually the film crew would come for about three key weeks each year mm -hmm. and then on that final season they were there for the, the entire uh, 19 days that it took us to climb the route wow incredible so, yeah what, lots what, lots of footage what has the imp been the impact on your world the rock climbing world what has that video done for that has it just made it mm -hmm. way more popular way more people trying it has there been any impact yeah no it's definitely there's definitely been impact i mean uh 15 years ago when I started climbing on El Capitan, doing the style of climbing that I, I like to do, big wall free climbing, there's like three people in the world that like to do it. Um, and now it's like the thing. It's like everybody knows about Alex Hondo. A lot of people know about the Dawn Wall. There's, you know, hundreds of people there every year trying to do these big wall free climbs. So that, that world specifically has grown a lot, but there's just the world of climbing has exploded for a lot of reasons. I mean, I think uh, the fact that modern day media has made it visually really interesting like people understand it now is part of it but also um it's just such a great fitness tool like people love going to the climbing gym and there's climbing gyms in every major city now so it's become like a more fun way to work out for a lot of people and things like american ninja warrior like climbers look like jacked and badass and so <laughs> yeah. they're seen as um you know at least especially competition climbers it's seen yeah. as a really good way to just like get strong mm. um, and then it's going to be in the Olympics and the next Olympics. So is it? Just, oh, wow. There's just a lot of, there's just a lot of things happening right now. Wow. Now I watched uh, Don wall with my kids and they were coming. My, my son is 14 now. Uh, my daughter's nine and they were completely mesmerized. Um, and my son wanted to know more information. So I, I watched one of your Ted talks and in both those there's, there's mention of, your relationship with your dad. And I think my son really connected with that hmm. quite a bit because him and I have a similar close type of relationship. 
Um, and a lot of your drive came from, uh, according to what you've said, your father, a lot of your ability to overcome adversity. Um, tell me a little bit more about that relationship that you had with him, because I found that absolutely fascinating and I'd like to know more. I mean, my dad's a pretty magnetic personality in general. He's a school teacher. He has this love of helping, you know, kids find strength in themselves. And I was like the perfect t- test subject because not only was I was, I was, I was his son, but I was, I was pretty small and really shy. And so he's like, I could use the outdoors and the mountains to kind of breathe to breathe strength into this guy, to give him confidence. And, because he was like a bodybuilder. Yeah, he was a bodybuilder, yeah. <laughs> Literally. In the 80s, but yeah, in the 80s, he was a bodybuilder. Um, and But he was also a mountain guide. So bodybuilding, I think, lasted like five or six years for him. Um, climbing was always his thing, um, other than those five or six years. And so... And you were like a small kid. You weren't... Yeah, I was like, little. Oh, he yeah. was taking you on like crazy climbs when you were like a baby, right? Yeah. Yeah. Really, really. From the age of three, we were getting out and doing big rock climbs. So getting way off the ground. Um, yeah, I was doing... I did my first like legitimate big wall climb, which is like a you know a face that's thousands of feet tall um, when I was like 12... But even before that, I was hiking around in the mountains and running from thunderstorms and doing things that at that time made most parents, most of his peers think that he was kind of insane. Like I almost, like you know, he, almost, he, almost he, I, he honestly almost killed me off on many occasions when I was pretty young. Like, <laughs> like he was very bold with me in a way that I like admire, but I try to like tone it down slightly with my own children. <laughs> yeah. Do you have an example of a time when that happened? Um, yeah, I mean, so, I mean, for my seventh birthday, I spent like running from this crazy thunderstorm. Like it was my first time up in the hot, up in the top, up high on a mountain where lightning was striking close enough that you were getting ground shocks. Like you could feel it in your spine. Uh, My dad got a little bit of arcing going on between his wool hat and his hair. So, um, we lived in the Colorado Rockies. So lightning is a very common occurrence Mm -hmm. there, but you know, as a seven year old, that stuff's pretty, pretty intense. Um, my dad was brought to life by that stuff. He's got this quality that I, that I really admire in people called joyful masochism. Like I call it when things get real, <laughs> when things get legit, his, he like lights up, you know, and I definitely inherited that from him. They, get, they get excited. And, that's hilarious. Yeah. Now, you, and, and, and when I said you were small, cause I, I watched one of your Ted talks and you, you were, you, you talked about being kind of small, skinny, awkward, then you have this big, bigger than life, muscular, Superman type of dad. Did you ever feel insecure? Or did he make you feel empowered? Like how was that? Uh, I mean, I always felt insecure at school or around peers. Like I was, I was super shy around other people. But my time with my dad was like another world for mm-hmm. me. That's that was that was exciting. Like there was no chance for me to ever get addicted to video games or something like that because our world outside together was so exciting and intense i mean he dragged me all over the world for my for my 12th when i was 12 he took me to bolivia and to europe and we climbed some of the biggest mountains in the alps and in bolivia um and so we were just going constantly going around doing super cool stuff from a really young age do you do you think that that being raised that way is what was what led to you being able to save your life and the fr- and, and the lives of your friends when you were held mm. captive uh, during that whole event? Yeah, I mean, certainly. I think that I, I've done a lot. I've done quite a bit of thinking about that. So in Kyrgyzstan, when me and our whole team got kidnapped. Yeah, if you don't mind don't telling know, the audience. Yeah, we might if, have to give a little context. Yeah, yeah a little yeah. context. Because that is just an insane story. I would love if you shared it with our audience. Right, I can try and uh, do a, a brief version of it, but... Uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah, when I was 21 years old, uh, my first big international climbing expedition was to southwest Kyrgyzstan, and uh, it was a North Face sponsored trip. And I was actually not a North Face athlete; I was just I was just kind of like a tag along boyfriend. My girlfriend at the time was a North Face sponsored athlete, and I I was there to help the production crew make make film make a make a make a film about the trip actually. 
but we went into this place that has some of the coolest, really good quality big walls in the world. Um, and it's in a very remote region, um, probably about 50 miles from the nearest road. We had to helicopter in. And in this year of 2000, it turns out that uh, a group called the Islamic Movement of Uzbekistan was... The political situation is kind of um, complicated, but essentially they were trying to pave an opium trade trail through the mountains to get drugs from one country to the other. And they were, when the high mountain passes melt out in August, they came over the high mountain passes and the Kyrgyz military came to combat, basically battle this group to not let them through and this mini war broke out. And we were kind of at the point of collision between these two forces. The rebels got to our to, uh, to us first, the Islamic movement of Uzbekistan. We were taken hostage. We're actually a thousand feet up on a wall sleeping in our portal edges and they came to the base of the wall. They shot up at us. Mm. Um, that's how we knew we had to come down. Now you didn't you didn't know about this going there, did you? Did no. You? Okay. No, no. This, so you find yeah. this out. Now this is a very, very unlucky um, situation. Wow. Uh, there has been things like this that have happened subsequently in, in different places like in um, Pakistan and so forth where these rebel groups come into these high mountain camps but we were kind of the first to really encounter it um, we didn't have much of a way of knowing that this could happen so you guys are sleeping up on the wall because you're trying mm. to climb something yep. and you hear gunshots sh gunshots and bullets was yeah gun gunshots there was a there was like a ceiling like a roof of rock above us and at first they were just shooting and so we thought it was rock fall or something but pretty but after a few shots uh, these bullets started to hit this roof of rock above us and so and it was that's how we woke up it was like six o'clock in the morning it was just twilight and so once that happened, we realized we were being shot at. We had a big, long telephoto camera lens. We were able to look a thousand feet down on the ground and see these guys that were in army fatigues with big guns. Mm. And uh, oh, so you throw your hands up and just like, uh, how did you, how did you handle that? Like, how did you, what did you guys do and react after that? Well, we, we, we took our time actually. We sat there, um, we discussed what to do. It's pretty obvious that there were good shots. We had two portal edges, which are like our hanging cots and they were about three feet apart and they were managing to get bullets right between them. So mm. they had, some, so you're like, we're not going to be able to get away. Yeah. They had some pretty, uh, accurate, like uh, sniper style rifle. And did it seem like they were just trying to wow. give you warning shots to get your ass down and they weren't actually trying to kill you at that moment? Right. Okay. Right. Yeah. It didn't seem like we were trying to be killed. Holy and cow. at first we were like, hopefully they're just going to rob us or something. So the mm. oldest member of our expedition went down first, John Dickey. Uh, we had, we had exactly a thousand feet of rope with us. And so we tied all our ropes together, went all, you know, he went all the way to the ground. We had walkie talkies. He got to the ground and, uh, and then, you know, encountered this pretty scary scene of these these guys that were wearing a mixture of army fatigues um, and Western mountaineering equipment that they have obviously stolen from another climbing expedition. Because the, there was a there was an adjacent valley that had a bunch of other climbers in it that they mm. that they basically encountered first. Oh wow! Um, and then and then they came over to our side. And they took us hostage, and they um and they had you know lots of guns and grenades, and they're heavily armed. This was a very visually obvious like a like a rebel force to be contended with. And so once John got down, he's like, "You guys got to come down here. There's no option." So we came down, and they ushered us back to our base camp, which it turns out they had already been to. They had slashed open our tents, uh, rummaged through all our gear, and they had taken a local Kyrgyz. Um, soldier and the way that those valleys work is there's these nomadic um, yak herders essentially that live in these valleys but usually there's one like military person that also he's basically just a uh, like a nomadic yak herder that the military hires and they'd taken him hostage and um, he looked very serious he had blood on his pants and so we were as we were at our camp kind of surveying the scene they told us to start packing things up and hiding them in the bushes and as this happened a helicopter flew up the valley from below and they started to panic and they said grab all your stuff hide it in the bushes and so this helicopter flew over and we were hiding in the bushes and all of our stuff was hidden but our tents had been there for a week so all the grass had died where they were and so it was i think to the helicopter it was obvious that you know, that's where we had been. Mm -hmm. mm. Um, and, and so that, that's when the Kyrgyz military started to kind of invade the valley and things got serious real quick. Mm -hmm. um, we started to run. We had to abandon everything, all of our food, warm clothes, everything, and, and start running under 
gunpoint down the valley we got to the convergence of these two rivers and um and we went across this bridge and up this one hillside as the as the, really the main force of the Kyrgyz military came in on the other side and this major gun battle erupted around and you us. were in the middle of this yeah we we're on one side of the valley uh they were on the other side probably like maybe 500 or 800 feet apart and we were hiding behind this whole this huge boulder and as soon as actually not like a car sized boulder and as soon as the uh the gunfire like the real battle started they shot that kirgi soldier his name was tarat they just shot him in the head um right, right in front there. of you yeah and we had to sort of like lay on his body to avoid getting shot um for the next three or four hours as this ba- battle rage now oh, as shit, this is going on long. yeah as this is going on tommy you're, you're 21 obviously you've never seen someone get shot before you've never been a, what do you, uh, what do you what's going through your mind are you got are you like trying to stay calm or are you just freaking out um, it's, it's a bit of both. I mean, you actually, uh, it's, I mean, it's, it's surreal. Like I had never experienced the kind, like I'd been used to dealing with fear and danger, but this is a different kind. Sure. And I think it like, even now looking back at it, it just seems absolutely surreal. Like it almost doesn't feel real. Um, but I think that like the human instinct is to actually react quite well. Like our team started to band together, really look after each other. Um, I remember uh, Beth, my girlfriend, when we were behind the boulder, um, she wasn't sure that I had seen Tara at the time. So she had kept trying to like keep my, had me try to like look in her face so that I wouldn't see him there. Mm. Um, but I did, I had seen him. Um, and you're just reacting as, as best you can. Um, Holy cow. So from there, the, the gunfire starts to die down and then you guys... Well, it got dark, actually. That's, okay. and that's what enabled us to flee the scene of the battle. Mm. Um, as soon as it got dark, we, with our four captors at this point, sort of fled up over this ridge that was behind us, away from, in the other direction, from the Kyrgyz soldiers. And then we spent the next six days in captivity hiding essentially being hunted by the Kyrgyz military so during the night hours we would kind of sneak from one location to the next we didn't really know where we were going we ended up just kind of making this big loop over six days and then at, at during the day we would hide um like under boulders or kind of like bury ourselves in in thick brush and have to lay perfectly still for for all the daylight hours Wow. Are you able to drink or eat or anything at this point too? Or you guys nothing? We had, we had abandoned everything except I had actually grabbed a small bag with five or six, um, power bars in it. And so each day we would split one power bar between, uh, well, it ended up being six of us because after that first there, we fled with four soldiers, but on that first night, two of them just disappeared. We never knew what happened to him. So for the majority of our six days of captivity, it was four climbers and two soldiers. And so we would, we would split one power bar between all of us. And then I would say about once a day, we would come across some water source, some, you know, some stream running down a mountainside that we could, that we could guzzle a bunch of water. And then at what, what point, cause I know it eventually happens, but at what point are you starting to think like, I got to do something or we got to mm. do something because this, this is inevitably going to end up us being killed or where, when do you st- when does that start turning in your head? Like this is not going the way we want it to go. And I'm going to, I got to get us out of this. Yeah. So the, the, the head of our expedition, this guy, Jason Singer, he's the one who put it together. He instantly started to strategize oh, okay. and, um, and we all were kind of strategizing, but I feel like he was like one step ahead of us. And so on that first night after we fled, You know, we fled over that hillside when it was dark. We got to this raging river and we didn't know if the Kyrgyz military was pursuing us at that point. And um, the the, the two Kyrgyz soldiers were trying to figure out how to get across this river. It seemed pretty dangerous. It was this very fast moving river. And, um, And then Jason, like grabbed this log or they started trying to awkwardly push like this dead tree across the river but it was kind of too heavy they couldn't get it across and the idea was to push it across and then we would climb across that and so jason grabbed the tree and just like jumped into this waist deep raging river and 
pulled this tree across the the river in this very like heroic moment. It seemed like he was getting he was kind of like fighting to not get swept swept oh, away by the current. Mm. And so he managed to pull it across and then we we're all able to climb across this tree. And when we got to the other side, the soldiers like looked at Jason and they're like, Soldad, which means soldier. And they were like this guy's this guy's like a soldier. He's helping us. Like wow. we're in this together. And that was that was strategic on his part part. He wanted mm. them to think that we were super tough, that we were and that we were with them. We were on their side. We were trying to we we're in this together. And so they, they Brilliant. Mm. Yeah, that 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 created this sort of air of trust. So for the next six days, um they they were still careful about how they treated us like they would split us up during the day when we would hide we would be split into two groups just so that um you know we'd be weaker that way mm -hmm. um but they did let us talk to each other um and so we would talk um and, you know we we didn't speak the same language at all they spoke no english at all and so we were able to talk strategy of how to escape the whole time oh, shit. but we would we would just sort of like make make it seem like we were talking about something else like we would give them code names and we would talk in sort of this laissez-faire attitude and mm. you know we would try and like laugh in the middle and stuff. <laughs> like so, i'm gonna push him off this cliff to yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah like that wow yeah. wow was there did you what happens next because i don't want to jump ahead but it, it feels like there was this you know, you guys knew you were captives, but they started trusting you. Did you guys start developing a strange kind of relationship where you're like, okay, we're kind of cool, kind of not, um, depending on each other type of deal? I think in a lot of ways we had the upper hand because we, um, they did believe that we were with them. They, mm. you know, we were always helping them, giving them food. You know, we had the only food. We would give them food. Um, they, they got to the point where they would hand us their guns at times to oh, try and climb up over things, and then we'd hand them back. But the whole time we were like, we have to find a way to escape. Um, now, and when they hand you the gun, did you did, did it ever cross yeah, your mind? That like, had to be I'm tempting. Just you know, blast these guys. Yeah, but yeah, um, especially Jason. But none of us really knew how to use the guns. And yeah, there was another guy with another gun right there, and mm -hmm. so it seemed it seemed pretty sketchy. Like we we would we would sit there and we'd look at the guns, and Jason and I were always during the day we were together, and he we would talk about like there's the safety, and mm -hmm. um, this is how you use the thing, and. Um, so it was always in the back of our mind. What a scary thought, though, because I I agree with you. You would you w would think, okay, grab the gun and shoot him. But if you've never shot like an AK forty seven, like what if there's no bullets in it? What if the right. safety's on? Yeah, and the guy who knows how to the other guy <laughs> yeah. who knows how to use it is standing right next. Yeah, to you're you. fucked. Sure. That would be so scary. Sure. Now, yeah. I, at some point, do, one of them breaks off from you guys, and you're left with just one. Uh, captive. Yeah, so we or, spent or six, six days basically wandering around and wasting away, getting progressively weaker. Jason and John, the two other male members of the expedition, the whole time they're like, our chance for escape is to overtake these guys, shoot them, like hit them in the head with rocks, push them off a cliff, something like this. Mm. Um, Beth and I uh, were more like, we should just try and outlast them. Like mm. they hiked over this big mountain pass to get to us. It seems too risky to try and overtake them. I think we can outlast them. Um, so we spent six days, and then on that sixth day, what happened is the main guy, Abdul, decided that we needed food. We certainly did need food. And so he was going to head back to our base camp and try and find some food, and he instructed us to climb up this really big, like, 2,000-foot mountainside. And it was, it was nighttime. It was hard to tell at that moment how steep that mountainside actually was. And so he was going to go back to our camp and then kind of circle around, and then we were going to rendezvous on top. Mm. Um, so he left, and all of a sudden, we're left with just one remaining captor. Um, this guy, Sharapov, was his name. He's like an 18-year-old hired mercenary. Um, we're climbing this steep mountain. He's got a big gun. He's in military boots. We're all wearing these kind of like lightweight climbing sneakers. And you guys are climbers. And we're climbers. We're super comfortable in this terrain. He is terrified. Mm. And it's just like dead obvious that this is our chance to escape. And then on top of that, it's there's like there's like rain in the air. Um, a storm was was kind of brewing and we had been really lucky that it hadn't stormed for the last six days because we're at 11,000 feet in elevation we have no warm clothing every every I mean we're probably in and out of hypothermia states of hypothermia for a lot wow. of these six days we'd all lost like 20 pounds I mean it was dire mm. um, and I was thinking to myself that 
maybe we're not going to be able to outlast these guys. Like if it rains, we're just all going to perish here on the mountain. We're just going to freeze to death. Mm. So um, as we're climbing up this mountain, we decide that Beth and I will stay ahead and sort of figure out the route that we need to take. And they will assist Sharapov from below, like point out handholds and footholds and help him over the, the sections. So he's totally relying on you guys to climb this. Yeah. You guys are helping him at this yeah, point. Yeah, he's fully, fully trusts us at that point. Mm. And so the plan is for them to get him into a spot where we're above, you know, a big steep cliff and just shove him off the edge. Mm. And so that was the plan. Um, I didn't want to have anything to do with that really. Cause I mean, we had watched him shoot this Kirky soldier. We'd, we'd seen a lot of carnage and I was just like, nah, I don't, you know, like I'd yeah. rather like, who are we to take somebody else's life? Like yes. That. What a struggle. Yeah. 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 And so that's why Beth and I were kind of ahead. We were mm. just like, not going to mm. deal with it. But it turns out that, it's really hard to push somebody off a cliff. Like you can think about it for days, um, but actually making that happen, maybe if you're a trained soldier or something, maybe it's a bit easier, but um, you know, Jason and John just like couldn't bring themselves to do it. So as we got close to the top of the mountain, um, Sheripov saw that we were going to top out and he was going to be away from the exposure, which he really didn't like the exposure. So he got kind of excited. He started to scramble ahead of us. And I went and I turned to Beth and I was like, you know, the, our, our chance is going to be over. Like, do you think I should do this? And she didn't say anything. And so I took that as that she'd be okay with it. So I scrambled up behind him and uh, right before he was about to kind of top out the mountain, I grabbed his gun strap and I pulled him off and watched him fall about 20 or 30 feet, hit a ledge and then bounce off into the blackness. And so I was convinced that I had killed him. Wow. Yeah. Now, how, oh my God. The, when I watched you talk about this the first time and when I hear you talk about it now, um, you can hear the, the just reconciling that you you may have killed a man or hurt a man. Um, how difficult was that, that, that moment for you? Because it's like you, you did it and then afterwards were you like, man, what happened? Yeah. I mean, I think there was a big, there was a big moral like dilemma in my mind because I was like, I was, I was shy. I was really like kind hearted. I never wanted to kill anybody. I was not like, mm -hmm. I was, I was like the farthest thing from like a macho man mm -hmm. you could ever really imagine. Um, and so I wasn't proud in any way. I was, I was, yeah, and then plus this guy Sharapov, like he, like I said, he was a hot, he was an eighteen-year-old hired mercenary. Um, he didn't know what he was getting into by joining onto this rebel mm -hmm. force. Um, and I, you know, I thought to myself, like if I was born in his situation, I might, I might be right there with him. And so, you know, killing somebody like that is just super unfortunate. You don't want to have to do that. Did you struggle with? feeling like it might change who you are and you know who you identify as uh yeah i did i was worried i was worried about judgment once i got back i didn't know if there's legal ramifications i mean there's just a mill there's like too much going on to really sort mm -hmm. through it and i would say that continued like the trauma from that experience continued for probably to this day honestly like it's still like there's a there's a there's a i mean it, it was like this ripple effect that is a that has changed who i am and all the four of us are in so many ways that mm. i'm still trying to kind of come to grips with do you think that it was almost necessary for you to be able to accomplish the don wall i think so i mean i was uh i mean it did did a bunch of things for me um on one hand i was i was really like i had a lot of despair about killing somebody but on the other hand i had it, like, it was kind of empowering because I was like, when everybody wonders if something real serious happens to them, are they going to have the skills? Are they going to be able to react and do what happen, do do what's necessary to get them out of that? And so at least I had that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then it also, as a professional climber, it gave me some tools. Um, like those days were so physically painful and and scary that it reset my bar for that kind of stuff. Like whenever I would go out in the mountains afterwards and we'd, you know, be on some 30 hour push without sleep or, 
you know, something that was scary. I think back to Kyrgyzstan. I'm like, this is nothing. Same yeah. shit. Yeah, yeah. This, yeah. Is, <laughs> this is even nothing close. compared yeah. to that. Mm -hmm. Like it, it, it made me realize that when we think we're at our breaking points, like really, we're not even close. We're like, a lot we had, tougher than we think. Yeah, we're way tougher than we think. Like we had to push ourselves way beyond what I ever thought we humanly could in those six days. And it wasn't just that last moment. It was like not eating for six days being unbelievably stressed and then having to climb this big mountainside. And then, you know, we think we're like on the, on the verge of death. And then I pushed the guy and all of a sudden we're adrenalized and we, and we sprint for like eight miles down Valley. Yeah. Um, so I, I think it, it, it built this huge curiosity about the limits of human capability. And as professional climbers, that's what we're always toying with. That's what we're trying to find. So if all of a sudden that barrier gets blown out of the mm -hmm. water, it's, um, it's useful. <laughs> Do you think you guys would have been killed if that, if you never did that? I think there's a chance we would have just frozen to death and, and perished up on the mm -hmm. mountain, either that, or we would have, we would have, um, or, or, um, Abdul, the leader would have found us again mm -hmm. And we would have ended up in some, uh, you know, pr camp or prisoner something. camp or yeah. something. I'm not, I'm now he sure. ended up the guy you pushed off the ledge. Did he die or did he end up not? So we thought he was dead, um, but about three months after we returned, a reporter actually figured out that he had survived and he was in prison in mm. in, in Kyrgyzstan. Wow! So you found that out three months after? Yeah. Wow. Okay. How well, did you feel? Like how did that change things for you? It was it was such a weird time for a lot of reasons, um, like, th well, there, there was this weird thing that happened. We came back and this media explosion happened. Like there was people knocking at our doors, trying to track us down. The story was, was a big story. And, um, and then out of seemingly out of the blue, there was a climber, this other Alpine climber who decided that we had made the whole thing up. And he started what? trying to spread this story about us making the whole thing up. What? And, and he was actually the one, or his wife was the one that found out that the guy was survived. So at first we're like, he's lying. He's got some, cause it, it seemed unfathomable that the guy had mm -hmm. actually lived, but uh, he, he had gone to Kyrgyzstan and he found out that the guy lived and it kind of fueled his, his story about us lying about the whole thing. And so, um, and so at first we didn't believe it, but then we saw pictures and we're like, yep, that's him. This happened. And so then, um, Jason and John went to Kyrgyzstan with a guy named Greg Child that was writing a book about our whole mm. situation. And they interviewed him in jail. Oh, and shit. Then, and then, yeah. and then Dateline also decided to make, Dateline and NBC decided to make a, um, a episode about this whole thing. And, and so all this, all this like media stuff is going on. And John Burchard was the guy's name who had found out that he was alive. So John was like fueling this one side of the story. And then Dateline actually solved it all because they, they just, they, they got the guy on video in Kyrgyzstan and they just straight up asked him. like the, the whole thing had come down to this point of like, did he get pushed? Did he not get pushed? Cause at first he's like, we made up the whole story. Nothing happened. But then obviously a war happened. People got killed. Mm. Um, and he's like, they, they just embellished the thing. And so it all came down to like, did he get pushed? Did they escape by pushing the guy? And, um, God, so that, got, had to, that had to piss you off. Oh, like, oh, oh tremendous. <laughs> what that did to your life and how that impacted you, like that, had, yeah. I would be fucking pissed that people were calling me a liar about something that I'm not proud of that I did, you know? Yeah, I'd be going to pay for gas in the gas station and I'd hear people like whispering about, did you hear about those Americans that, or did you hear about those kids in Kyrgyzstan that just like made up this story? Like it, it really started to like catch hold. Mm -hmm. But then Dateline, they just got him on camera and they're like, did you get pushed? And he's like, yep. I got pushed, mm. and so the story was basically done. Wow. Cool. Now, how, is that, what, how has that been for you? Because, you know, I would think that somebody who's into rock climbing is kind of an introvert, private person, and you're being out in nature, and now you've got fucking cameras and media. All eyes on you. Yeah, what's that transition been like for your life? Uh, I mean, back then, I didn't know how to deal with it. I just, like, receded into a hole, essentially. Like, mm. me, I ended up marrying um, Beth, who was the other girl, and we lived... I mean, we we're professional climbers, so we had to be somewhat public in a way, but we tried to avoid that as much as possible and just do our own thing. And that's how I lived for 
10 years because um, oh, wow. I just, I didn't know how to deal with it. Like people, it, it exposed both the good and the bad of humanity in a lot of ways. Like I kind of started to hate the press in a lot of ways, but then after some years of reflection, I was like, well, you just, you can't control what people think. Actually, most people are really good. There's always going to be a few lunatics out there and you can't worry about that. Mm. Um, so I went through a whole evolution. Now, how long after that event did you have your almost career ending hand injury uh that was like a, a year later so a year after that you're yeah. and what were you doing exactly when this yeah. when this happened uh i was just building a stand for like uh beth and i had bought this little 600 square foot rundown cabin we were remodeling it i had bought some books at the home depot on how to like build stuff i didn't know what i was doing borrowed a table saw um, chopped off my finger. Oh, um, and it wasn't just any finger. It's one of the more important, it's your index finger. Isn't that one of the more important ones for climbing? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I've yeah, heard it being all explained. Pretty important, I suppose. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's pretty, pretty but important. In, <laughs> in particular, there's a grip that you guys use, right? With your, where you put your thumb over your index finger in order to give you kind of a strong yeah. grip. Yeah. And so you lost your index finger. And for all intents and purposes, it's everybody's probably like, well, you're done. You're done being a pro or whatever. Yeah, I mean, definitely everybody thought that. Um, and and it was at a time where I really needed climbing. Like climbing was, it was always the bright thing in my life. It was the only thing I was really that good at. Your it's outlet. kind of what I focused on. And after Kyrgyzstan, I was like, I need something that brings me happiness. And so climbing was that. And I would, Beth and I had figured out a way to do it full time. So it was... You know, we were still recovering from Kyrgyzstan, but in a lot of ways, we lived a very, very amazing life. And all of a sudden, cutting off my finger, I was like, well, that's that's done now, too. Um, but uh, I don't know. It, it, the way that it all played out um, was pretty interesting. Like, I, I chopped off my finger. We went to the hospital. I spent – my parents showed up at the hospital. They had talked to the doctors. They are like, climbing is what he does. You need to do everything you can. I ended up in the intensive care unit, which doesn't normally happen for a finger. And <laughs> they went to all lengths to try and reattach this thing. So I went through three surgeries. I had a bunch of blood transfusions. They kind of did everything they could to try and reattach this thing and make it work. But it just didn't work. So after a couple weeks – a doctor came into the room. Um, he sat me down and he said, we've done everything we can. Your finger's dead. We're going to have to, you know, remove it once and for all. And then he said, I think you should think about what, start thinking about what else you want to do in, do in life. And he just kind of verbalized my biggest fear, fear because he's like, you're not going to be able to be a professional climber. Um, so I just like sat there and listened to that. He got up and left and then shortly thereafter, Beth looked at me and he's like, fuck that guy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 No Did you idea. let that like come in at all or were you just immediately like, no way? I mean, for a moment I did. Um, but I think that I, there, you know, I really wanted to still climb. And there's something liberating about taking away all expectation. Like nobody expected me to come back from that injury. Oh, yeah, the underdog now. Yeah, yeah and I didn't expect to come back from that in, in, in that injury. So any success that I had going forward was exceeding my own expectations oh, yeah. and everybody mm. else's expectations, which is actually very liberating. So mm. I came out of the hospital. I went to the climbing gym and I was like, ah, you know, it, it feels weird, but I can actually still climb. And that was sort of uplifting. And then I was like, maybe I should like start training and see how far I can take this. And it just became like this, this incredible flywheel that just started spinning faster and faster and faster. And it, and it ultimately fueled this incredible, drive like um, I became way more serious and way more dedicated than I ever had been about climbing and ultimately I made these goals of, cl of climbs that I had failed on with all my fingers and I was like if I can do these there's two climbs if I can do these two climbs I'll prove to myself that I that I still have it and so um, within a year I had done both those climbs and then I just kept on going and that's when I got really really involved in El Cap and I spent about 10 years um, thriving. I'm, I'm, I'm certain that I would never be at the place that I am now without those two experiences. You have to explain for the audience uh, the difficulty of El Capitan in comparison to most rock climbing. I like mean, rock, rock climbing is got so many different facets. Um, what I'm interested in is big wall free climbing, which are the biggest 
walls in the world. Um, El Cap is center stage. El Capitan is center stage because it's sort of the best rock and it sets, sits right in the heart of Yosemite National Park. So it's also the most accessible. Um, but yeah, what I try and do is, is climb these really, really long, big, hard routes on big walls. Right. And in, 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 in explain to the audience the, the Dawn Wall. This is the part of El Capitan that is nobody had ever climbed because it was basically smooth. There's like very difficult, it's uh, not much you can do on there to climb it. Yeah, general, generally when you go and climb a big wall, you you show up at the base with binoculars and you start looking for weaknesses, for crack systems, for holds to grab onto. And so all of the routes before the Dawn Wall on El Cap followed these pretty obvious weaknesses, these crack systems. Um, I spent 12 years of my life climbing all those routes and... I got to the point where I knew more about climbing on that wall than anybody because I had more experience. And I realized that that these very, very blank, steep looking sections of the wall are actually possible to climb if you train yourself, if you, if you train properly and you learn how to grab onto these really, really small holds. And then if you stick at it long enough, you can kind of like rehearse these <coughs> routines to get through these blank sections of rock that seem absolutely impossible from afar. And I think that's one thing that I found really interesting, something that to me at one point had seemed absurd, like completely ludicrous, now seemed possible. Mm. And to everybody else, it seemed absolutely ludicrous too. But I knew so much about it that I was like, if I spend enough time on this on this climb, maybe I can figure it out. And then on top of that, I was still looking for, I was still really curious about the limits of, of human capability. Like Kyrgyzstan had opened that up inside of me, but I had never truly tested it. So I was mm -hmm. looking for something that would truly test that. And so, yeah, that's how the Dawn wall came to be as essentially. Are, are there specific pitches that are like still ingrained in your head to where you could even think like left hand here, right hand here, left foot here. If you, cause you've had to rehearse it so many times. Yeah. It's probably like learning a language or something like you, I mean, we had to learn, you know, hundreds of thousands of micro details. On the hardest climbing, you have to not only memorize the holds and the sequence that you grab them, you have to memorize every minute body position. It's very much like having a, you know, a very complicated gymnastics routine or something that lasts days and days and days and having to like memorize every tiny little foot movement and the angle of your feet and the angle of your hips and the distance that your elbow is from the wall. And all this kind of stuff. And so, yeah, there's sections that I could still rehearse, but now it's been four years. So some of that stuff's getting slightly fuzzy. Yeah, but yeah. There was a point, um, I'd say when we finished the climb, I probably could have sat in the studio and been like, okay, you walk to the base of the wall and you, <laughs> you put your right hand on this little edge that faces, faces slightly left and you put your index finger on this sharp little point and then you put your, you know, and I, I could have like, explained in such detail that it would have taken me like two days to explain. Uh, was there like literally no <laughs> improvisation at all? It was all like no, in your head? Th th there was some improvisation for sure. Like the, the hardest sections you had to memorize with that amount of detail, but then the easier sections you would, you, you, we didn't spend nearly as much time on those. And so we we're able to, um, sort of just get through them every time. Mm -hmm. And we could have end endlessly worked on it and gotten better and better at climbing um, each section. Now, one thing too about the Don Wall that I just, I loved this part that you came back for your partner. I thought that that was like one of the coolest, the coolest things in terms of like, you could have finished, you could have finished and, and your partner would have still been there, but you went back for him. Yeah. You know, that's interesting. Like, the movie probably helped me appreciate that a bit more than I did even in the moment. Hmm. I mean, I grew up in this, in this culture of climbers and of mountaineers. And, you know, like when you hear those stories of people leaving their dead partner up on the mountain on Everest, those are the kind of stories that we despise. Like those are not climbers, you know, those oh. are, <laughs> those are, those are the, you know, those are not the heart of what we do. So the idea of going up, with Kevin and not topping out with him, like that wasn't even a question. For oh the wow! Most part. I mean, there was a bit. It was a bit of a question. I knew that it was a possibility, hmm. but I had this like this physical aversion towards having that happen. Almost okay. like it's not worth it. Oh wow! Yeah, yeah right. Yeah. It, it would have just been. It just would have been sad overall. And then that seven-year journey on the Donwall was. It was like such a magical time in life that, in my mind, if if 
we didn't top out that year, we'd come back the next year and the journey would just continue. Like at some point it, it was no longer about finishing the climb. It was just about like that adventure that we were having and what we were learning and how we were growing through that experience. And the top was, and like actually finishing it in the end was much less of a big deal. Now, in my mind. now explain the process of this seven year journey. You're going there. You said earlier, you're, you're spending two or three months kind of creating a path. So are you basically just living out there for that long figuring out ways to go up and then you got to go home and then the next year you come back and then you try and add to that and so on? I mean, I formatted my life for the majority of those years to try and become a better climber in that specific way that the Don Wall required. Um, so usually two to four months a year, we'd be in Yosemite. And when we're in Yosemite, about half that time would be up on the wall, living out of our port of ledges. Um, What's the longest time you spent up there? Uh, when we finally did it, 19 days was the longest time. But we'd go up there for like four or five days at a time and then come down and kind of go up and down. You know, we'd go up. I mean, it's, it's a pretty harsh environment to live in. Yeah, in I can climb. imagine. And the, You're hanging off the side of the granite bit. wall. Yeah, yeah and the climbing is really hard. Um, so usually when you're up there, you just progressively get weaker and weaker. So you have to come down and eat good food and recover and rest. So we'd go up, get beat down, come back down. Um, rest and kind of go up and down. And then we got so efficient at going up and down um, that uh, by the end, we would sometimes just go up for the evening and work on the hard pitches in the middle of the wall and then come back down. Wow. And, and now I'm sure you get this question asked all the time. None of us are climbers. How does it work going to the bathroom? You're up on the wall. You're hanging. <laughs> yeah. You got to take a shit. That's funny. That's, yeah. that's Look that's out like, below. That is probably the most common question. Of like, course. Like when people come yeah. to Yosemite and they see people up there, that's the first thing like, that comes to mind. Don't get too mind. close. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we, you have to bring a container, essentially. So you're next to your buddy and you're like, hey, man, I'm going to take a dump right now. Yeah, right. That's, yeah. <laughs> hey, you bro, have to get turn used the to other that. way. Like, like literally sitting right next to your buddy. I mean, you live on these little portal ledges, which are like seven feet long and three feet wide. And I'm getting eight, right now hearing you talk. My hands are getting sweaty and my oh feet my feel tingly. <laughs> Imagining hanging off yeah. of a wall that high and then sleeping. Do you sleep good? Yeah. You sleep really good. Yeah, because uh, <laughs> you're I mean, when you're not on the portal ledge, there's nothing, right? You're, you know, you're you're hanging in your harness. You're hanging on the small holds. The wind is usually whipping by. The sun is really intense. It, it just feels very uncomfortable until you get in that portal ledge. And now at least you're in your sleeping bag. You have some something underneath you like... Uh, you know, comfort is is a is a matter of perspective, and so um, comparatively, the portal edge feels like a wonderfully comfortable, <laughs> like <nest>. a luxury <laughs> hotel. <laughs> exactly. Is it is it hard for you to? Do you find it more challenging to live in what most people would consider regular life, like this kind of life here, versus living that kind of a life where you're con you're driving towards this insane, what most people would consider impossible goal? living on the side of a mountain half the time and being away from most uh, quote unquote normal regular people. Is that more comfortable for you than this type of world? Uh, I mean, I'm addicted to the stimulus of it, I suppose. And I definitely crave it constantly. I wouldn't say that it's more comfortable though. Like when you're up, you know, when you're on a big climbing expedition and everything just is painful, you, you crave home. Um, you want those creature comforts. Mm. Um, but then when you're home, you crave that. So um, I just try and strike the balance as best I can. Has Ex anybody else climbed that wall now since you've done yeah, it? Yeah. So there's this phenomenal climber from the Czech Republic um, named Adam Andra, who's absolute phenom. Like he's dominated every aspect of rock climbing there is. And he came and about three years after we did it, he, he managed to repeat the climb. Wow. wow. Good now, deal. is there is there competitiveness amongst all you guys, or is it are you guys all close? No, there's there's competitiveness, but I'd say for the most part, it's real friendly competitive competitiveness. Mm -hmm. Like there's a there's a great culture of camaraderie. Like when Adam Andre came, you know, it was a big deal in climbing because he is the world's best by like miles, um, and um, we gave him every bit of information that we could. We came and we taught him how to do some of the logistical things. Oh, that that's need, cool. So there's, that need to be done yeah. and. So that's that's just what you do. It's always it's always really good hearted. Now, how do you guys yeah. measure who the best in the world is? Like, how does right. that how does that get measured? Is it a time thing at this point, uh, or are they going to climb it backwards? Like, how are they going to top <laughs> that? I mean, there's various metrics. So, generally, this the easiest way historically to measure the best in the world is two ways. There's there's climbing competitions. 
um, where they set these artificial roots. Like snowbird, like your first yep. big win? Okay. Yep. And generally the way those work is they make the roots harder and harder as you go up. And so the person who makes it the highest wins. Um, but also every climb is given a number grade um, by the first ascensionists. And then that can be adjusted by subsequent ascents. But um, the real experienced climbers can just climb a route and be like, oh, that feels like, you know, 514. And so the people that climb the hot, the hardest number grades, I suppose, are considered the best. Mm. So explain that because that was one of the things I found interesting, too, is like how you guys grade pitches on like the difficulty, like you just said, 514. Like what is like the hardest and and explain too how many El Capitan has in comparison to most other places. So. Yeah, so on the Dawn Wall, there are a couple pitches that are 514 C or D. Um, currently, the hardest climb in the world is 515 C. Um, 51 is the kind of thing that most people could just do, even if they're non climbers. And then 515 C is the hardest in the world. So it's just like um, a scale. Yeah, a scale yeah. in between those. Are there rivalries between different types of, of climbers, like people who climb? Like what you do versus like mountaineers versus like bouldering. Yeah, I watched a documentary on some of the first climbers in uh, Yosemite, and there was one guy who would just hammer it, you know, hammering nails into the wall and climb like that. And he had a rivalry with another guy who's like, "That's not climbing," and he'd right. go up and break his. He'd like use a chisel and, and chisel out his the guy's nails and say, "Those yeah. don't belong." Are there rivalries like that still? Yeah, less than there used to be. Like the ethics of climbing are constantly being debated. Um, I would say those, those like campfire debates where people that get real heated are they're like almost like when that happens, you're like, Oh, those are just like old guys. They're not now, now people are much more respectful and accepting of all the various styles of climbing, but it used to be people would try and draw this little circle ethically around exactly the style of climbing that they were the best at and tell everybody else that, um, that sure. didn't count. And that was, that was good and bad. I mean, there was a lot of ego involved, but it also preserved the environment in some ways. Like, um, in Europe, they just, they take power drills and they put in anchor bolts all over the place. The ethics of Yosemite didn't allow that, which preserved the adventure. So now you have to do a style of climbing called trad climbing where you bring your little, your little kit of tools, your cams and your nuts, and you place them in cracks and the climbing is more dangerous for sure. Mm -hmm. But, um, but that that uh, that risk assessment and figuring out how to make things that are dangerous mm -hmm. safe is is a very exciting part of it, and that doesn't exist as much in Europe mm -hmm. because they've just they've just bolted everything. Do you mm. find uh, normal life boring? Uh, I mean, there's certain aspects like a Caribbean cruise is probably my worst nightmare, which I had to do. <laughs> <laughs> I had to do one of All those, those buffets. At one point. But, uh, I mean, one, one really cool thing is, uh, you know, I think I was ignorant at one point in my life. I thought this world of adventure climbing was like, like we had found this key to life, to excitement, to happiness. And like only climbers had this, you know, I lived in this community of incredibly vibrant, like life loving, very athletic like just people that operated on this really high level and i thought climbing is what provided that since the dawn wall i've gone around and i've done all these you know big speaking conferences and i've met high achieving people from all different disciplines and i'm like yeah no climbing is just one avenue you know and it really exists everywhere so you know what is normal life it can be different for everyone well that's a uh, chasing flow have you have you read rise of superman by chance yes yeah uh, so when you that, say that's what that is that's chasing flow right i mean right. and there's yeah. other aspects of life that you could chase flow in absolutely do you yeah. do you do you recall moments of when you're climbing where you feel that flow state like, oh yeah i mean i think about it constantly and i think there's several levels the way i think about it is there's several levels of flow state but that sort of like optimal flow state which that book rising uh rise of superman talks about where sort of the the body chemicals start flowing and you you know time slows down and all of a sudden you feel super human almost in a way i feel like i've only experienced that sort of flow maybe three or four times in my life oh really and oh. um but you remember those moments and you spend your life pursuing them in ways take us through take yeah us what through, are those yeah what were those moments i mean so they have to be 
there has to be a lot at stake. Right, death-defying almost. Yeah, yeah, either death-defying. So I've had a few where something went wrong, um, like I'm on the side of some big climb and the you know the mountain starts to fall apart and I'm looking at some giant like deathly fall and I just like react and manage to pull it off and not not have not have that fall. So that's happened to me a couple of times. Um, but it actually did happen on the Don Wall too. After seven years of working on this thing the hardest section pitch uh 14 for me was the hardest pitch i experienced that flow state like suddenly after seven years of struggling and it feeling nearly impossible i so much was at stake that i got to this moment where i just floated through it suddenly and wow. I was like, wow, what just happened? It felt, <laughs> it felt so magical and amazing. And I noticed, I noticed, yeah, it felt effortless. And I, and I was aware of every tiny little thing and it just like made it happen. And, huh. and so, yeah, there's, there's, there's a, it's a dangerous sport, isn't it? There's a lot of deaths in, in, in climbing, especially solo, if, I, if I'm not mistaken. There's not actually that many deaths from solo climbers. I mean, most serious soloists do eventually die by numbers. Um, that's a crazy statistic i remember reading that yeah yeah um but i would say the more dangerous even more dangerous discipline is is big like super alpinism Mm. where you're climbing these big snowy mountains because on when you're on big snowy mountains you're not attached to the mountain avalanches happen Mm. you know ice wipes you off the side of the mountain and i would say in my lifetime there's probably i've probably had 40 plus acquaintances or friends die. 40? 40? Yeah. Wow. wow. Oh so God. it is pretty safe, but you can make it incredibly, or it is pretty dangerous, but you can make it really safe as well. So like going to the climbing gym is, is super safe. Sport climbing on those, on those bolts, that's super safe. Like people almost never die doing that. So you can decide how much risk to take. Um, the problem is the more risky disciplines do tend to be a bit addicting. Mm. And I don't know. They're admired as well. And I don't know. Sometimes I wonder why they're admired. It's almost like to me, it seems almost like a drug addiction in a way. Do you feel Mm -hmm. like do you feel like you meet some people that almost seem like they have a death wish? Mm. Is that common in your space? Like where you see a guy who's just like, man, he's just pushing the limits constantly. Uh... I don't ever think of it as a de- death wish. It's almost like they have a life wish. Like they want to live this higher level. And so that's why they're doing it because they want to like thrive and like, like see the, see life with like the zest and this amazingness that they're chasing that, that ultimate flow state. Right. Or yeah. They're chasing that ultimate flow state. So, um, is, is drug yeah. and alcohol abuse common in that? I would imagine, I would think it would be because you're always seeking this feeling and if you don't get it from one thing, then you'll find it somewhere else, or is it, or are they actually not because they find it somewhere else? Well, there was one period of climbing where it was pretty prevalent in the in the in the late seventies on El Cap, specific, El Capitan specifically, when they were aid climbing, they were oh, you know, it was thought of as a very adrenaline sport back then, and so people were up there tripping on acid constantly, and so all the <laughs> routes, um, like wow. the actually the Don Wall, the route that it mostly follows is a route called Mescalito. There's Tangerine Trip, like all the routes are named after. Drug. Oh, sure. Drugs, actually. <laughs> That'll yeah. make it extra challenging. Huh? <laughs> That's very yeah. interesting. But nowadays, the highest performers to, to really like be competitive, I guess, or to perform at a really high level, you got to you gotta live a pretty clean life. So I think that drug use and addiction is, is much less prevalent than it used to be. And some of the performance enhancing aspect of it is, is probably there, but it's, it's not really known about that much. And um, yeah, I would imagine it, that anabolic steroids, because of the weight gain, yeah, yeah. It, it could negatively affect you. Yeah, and it, yeah, steroid use isn't 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 a thing. Like you don't want to do that. For some for some big Himalayan, Himalayan alpinists, where there's becoming the style of climbing, where people try and climb the biggest mountains in the world as fast as they can. Mm. Um, there's probably there is certainly drug use in the same way that road cyclists. Um, yeah, EPO or yeah. whatever and stuff yeah. like that. But yeah. otherwise, you'd want to be as because we had you squeeze the gripper, and you do have very strong hands, but uh, the strength that you require, a lot of it has to do with the strength to weight ratio. Like, you have to have strong hands and also be light for that type of strength to be able to climb. Anabolic steroids would be terrible for that. Right. I mean, I think that time is proving that the style of climbing that I'm most into, which is really technical big wall climbing, 
um, the smaller the better. Like if you think about it, a spider is a way better climber than an elephant. So like really small people are going to be better at that style of climbing. Um, except for the, the the other side is they can't get all, they can't like carry their stuff up the mountain. <laughs> Too small for that. Um, there are other styles of climbing like like speed climbing, one of the disciplines in the Olympics where you just try and sprint up a fifty foot wall as fast mm-hmm. as you can. Um, then you kind of need steroid use probably would help in that. So Whatever there's that where it's just like raw power and you're out in these big holes and mm-hmm. you're just like throwing them, throwing them down to the ground as, as hard as you can. What are the other, uh, you know, parts of in the Olympics? What are the other events that they're going to have? So there's going to be three disciplines and it's, it's pretty, it's pretty controversial this year because the three disciplines, um, usually the, the type of climber that is good at each specific discipline is very different. So one is speed climbing where they have a standardized route. You can rebuild it anywhere in the world. It's like, it's like 55 feet tall and the best climbers climb it in like five to six seconds. Um, and that's not something that was historically part of climbing. It's this weird thing where people are like, why is that part of the Olympics? That's just, <laughs> that's just made for the viewers. It seems very weird. Yeah, it seems like those videos where uh, I've seen like firefighters where they climb up really fast up this like tower and yeah. that became like really popular. I don't know right. if maybe that started or not. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's a little bit like that. So that's, the, that's sort of the, the dark horse discipline of the Olympics. And then there's bouldering, which is um, trying to climb a wall that's usually... 20 to 25 feet tall over big like gymnastic pads and that's very um that's kind of change climbing too because it's like american ninja warrior style like obstacle courses have had a big influence and so a lot of that is like jumping between these seems these more explosive like big holds and these mm-hmm. yeah it's yeah it's very explosive um but it also takes a lot of flexibility and coordination um and then there's and then there's sport climbing which is a wall that's like 100 feet tall and so you have to have good forearm endurance to get to the top of that so it's sport climbing bouldering and speed climbing you have kids tommy i do yeah i got a three and a six year old good deal now are they into climbing with you they are they are into climbing because that's what we that's what we do as a family like it's a great way to see the world and all of our friends are climbers so um yeah. Yeah. They, they, they climb, but I don't, yeah, I don't think they're going to be obsessed climbers the way that I am. <laughs> <laughs> Tommy, take us through, uh, how does a, a climber survive financially? Like is, is there money in it? Uh, what, what, what point can you make good money on it? What's, what's that like? So the history of climbing was one where being a dirt bag, being a homeless person was actually very admired because that meant that you sacrificed everything for the pursuit because there was no way to make money back then really. So the people that lived in caves in Yosemite, those were, the, those were the purists. Mm. And so I grew up admiring that in a lot of ways. And I lived my period of time right out of high school on, you know, $50 a month or something like that. And if I figured out a way to make more money, it was almost like I was selling out. Oh my God. <laughs> wow. And so I would dumpster dive and, you know, live no on almost shit. no money. And so, and honestly, it was a, it was a wonderful time in life. Like <laughs> I love everything was so simple, so simple. Yeah. And I could, I could focus completely on climbing. Hmm. Um, so having lived through that is pretty nice because now money is almost like a non-issue. Cause I know that if most of my money went away, it's a little different now with the family, but I knew that I, I know that I would be happy kind of regardless. Like I know how to live really simply. And I know that if you're living in the mountains and you're in these communities of people, like it can be absolutely wonderful. But now there is a lot of ways to make money. The industry's the industry is growing. So, um, you know, professional climbers nowadays, uh, it probably, it probably mirrors a lot of society, like gaining an audience is kind of how you end up sustaining a life as a professional climber through, you know, making movies, social media followings, um, you know, that kind of stuff. So, um, and now, now, now there is an audience that used to be like, nobody cared about climbing. Right. Right. Um, now people do. So, um, yeah, now I'm, I make a, I make a great living. Well, take us through your journey. I mean, you were dumpster diving and then you have Netflix. We have another film that's coming out soon. Like what has that journey been like for you? And are you the type of person who just now takes all his extra money and just buries it under a rock? Cause you, <laughs> you've learned to live. <laughs> no, I mean, so I, I, when I was, 
18 or 17 years old, I started to get a little corporate sponsorship. I went on that trip to Kyrgyzstan with the North Face. My mm -hmm. wife was a more successful climber than I was, uh, my girlfriend at the time. Um, and she, she got sponsored by the North Face, which she got a little bit of money, but basically that meant they would pay for her to go on trips. And so we would, we would kind of do that. We'd live from trip to trip a little bit funded by, by big, big climbing gear manufacturers. And so I would say the most of my climbing life has been that, like I get, I get a paycheck from big climbing gear manufacturers. Um, and then, and then I write articles, um, for climbing publications. So there's a little bit of writing involved. And then I've also gotten into a lot of gear testing and innovation. So it becomes a lot like freelance work. And then nowadays, um, my main employer is Patagonia and that company is started by a climber, but now is all about environmental issues. So now I'm a, an environmental activist. So I've gotten into that as well. Um, so yeah, you do a, a ton of things. Yeah, tell us a little bit about that. I know that your, yours is um, uh, Alaska, right? The Refuge, isn't that what you're... Yeah, that's what I've been talking about recently. Yeah, share yeah. a little bit about that. Yeah, so uh, in the last tax funding bill, they opened up a provision to drill in the Arctic, which has been a fight since the 70s. You know, people, mm -hmm. you know, everybody knows about ANWR, the fight to preserve mm -hmm. ANWR, ANWR, which it, it's, a, it's, a, it's public lands, right? It's a, it's a, a wildlife refuge that is preserved for the wildlife. Largest in the world, isn't it? Uh, it might be the largest wildlife refuge in the world. I believe it is. Yeah, and Did they find oil under it. And there is there is an undetermined amount of oil mm. in Anwar. We don't really know. As the Arctic is melting, um, it's opening up a lot of areas to to oil drilling that have really historically been in, inaccessible. Um, and wire is, you know, set aside as public lands. And then in the last, the way that politics works these days is when they want to open something up into drilling, they just like sneak it into another package and most people, it goes unnoticed. So all of a sudden in the last tax, tax pass, um, the, the last tax funding bill, they opened and to drilling and most people didn't know about it. So then the, the environmentalists figure that out and they're like, Oh God, suddenly this happened. Mm. Um, we need to, um, introduce a counter bill to once again protect the arctic so i've gotten involved in trying to spread the word about um yeah preserving and wire as a wildlife refuge so i went up there i did this wonderful climbing slash pack rafting trip where we traveled through the Arctic wildlife refuge and we encountered, you know, wolves and grizzly bears and these giant herds of like thousands of caribou. And it's for sure the most wild place I've ever been. And then we went and we talked to the, to the, the original owners, the, the local tribes, the Gwich'in. We went to a, a summit um, for the Gwich'in up there and we heard from them about what they wanted. And then I come back and become a messenger try to try to spread the word and figure out what the right thing to do is good deal you cool. feel pretty driven behind it yeah yeah i mean climbing climbing i think one of the things i love about climbing is that it's i'm always involved in something that feels grand it feels almost like greater than i can comprehend and so the mountains always have felt that way to me el, el cap has always felt that way to me but there's not a ton of purpose beyond your own personal experience in that i think um activism creates that purpose um, in a way that is really important these days. I mean, I'm, I'm, I mean, Patagonia and myself included really thinks that, you know, it's all over the news these days, but I think climate change is a big deal. And so um, public lands, protecting public lands is a good way to kind of protect, protect the resource and prohibit drilling in places like Anwar. Can awesome. you talk about the new film? Yeah. 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 Tell me about it. So this is, this is a small film. So I've worked with the same filmmakers since, you know, since I was 17 years old. Um, they generally would release small, originally like VHS tapes <laughs> about these climbs that would just be sold online. Um, they eventually started a film tour called the Real Rock Film Tour. And that's how most of their content was absorbed. It's a festival tour that has like four or 500 locations worldwide. Um, and every year they create these films and they release them on the festival tour. Um, and that's what they did for a bunch of years. And then the Dawn Wall happened where it was a story that they felt like could transcend their festival tour. So they were able to get funding from Red Bull and kind of take that film to the next level. 
Um, but they still really um, are endeared to their festival. And so this next year, in this, this October, um, the Real Rock Film Tour is going to be about 50% of it is going to be a film about Alex Honnold and myself speed climbing the nose of El Cap, which the Donwall was the hardest route on El Cap. The nose is the easiest, but we were trying to climb it as fast as we can, we could. So it's sort of the polar opposite to what I did on the Donwall. Now, the is Donwall, there a record that you're trying to break? Yeah, so the Donwall took us 19 days. Um, ultimately, the nose took us under two hours. And that was, it's kind of like the racetrack of climbing. Um and there's, it's sort of a historic race. In the 70s, it was, you know, it was it, if, I think it, for, it, the first time it was done, it took like eight months. And then by the late 70s, they, you know, a group of climbers did it in a day. And then it's progressively been just done faster and faster What's ever the record? since then. And so now, sort of like the holy grail, the four minute mile of climbing was to do the nose in under two hours. And so Alex Honnold and I managed to do that. Um, oh, good uh, deal. This last spring. And so this next year's Real Rock Film Tour is going to feature a film about uh, that. That's awesome. That is wow. looking that is, forward to watching that. Awesome. that. How, do you know how I'm curious? We kind of uh, glaze right over the uh, Netflix and, and getting it picked up. Like, uh, is that very profitable? Did you make anything out of that or just the film crew? Like, how did that, how did that work? Like, how did that go down? Like, once you guys shot it, like, how did you find out? And was that a big deal? Like, holy shit, Netflix picked it up. We're all going to make money or, um, I mean, I made some money off of it, a little bit of money. I mean, I think, well, so Jimmy Chin, who made Free Solo, which everybody knows what that film is. He had previously made a movie called Maru, which was, had a large major theatrical release. And so we had that model to follow somewhat like that movie was relatively successful and it transcended sort of the normal, the typical climber audience, um, you know, brought it to the, to a larger world. And so when the Don wall happened and it went big in the media and that climb went real big in the media is on the cover of the New York times, like seven days in a row. By the time we topped out, there's like 10 news trucks. Like people were just real interested um, you know, they had been filming it for those seven years, but they didn't know how they were going to make their money back. And so when that happened, they're like, whoa, there's interest. And so they were able to kind of like package it, package it up and say, we're going to, we're going to make this film that we're going to release theatrically and we need funding for that. So they got Red Bull Media House to sign on. They gave them uh, you know, like enough money to make the movie. And that's how I got a little bit of money. I've never, you never get paid directly from making films in the past as a, as a talent. But I did in this case, I got a little bit because I was really like kind of part of the crew in a lot of ways. And so, um, yeah, for the first time we got a little bit of money and then, so they did a theatrical tour and then, and then it, um, yeah, and then Red Bull sold it to Netflix. And so that's how most people saw it. And I think most people saw it on Netflix because they kind of blew the theatrical release. You no, know, like climbing films hadn't gone that big in theaters at that point. So they didn't realize that there was that much interest. So they did these one day releases. <laughs> so there was only two day that they did one, one day release and like every 600 mm. theaters sold out in the U S oh, wow. and they're like, wow, people really want to see this. So they're like, I guess we'll do one more day. <laughs> so they did one more day and like all the theaters sold out again, but they're already on that path. They're like, okay, sorry, I guess nobody else gets to watch this movie movie except netflix wants to pick it up so turns out on the don wall most people saw it on netflix because they just missed those mm -hmm. two yeah i didn't days. know about it till netflix so so yeah. who makes out the most out of it is it red bull because red bull initially picked it up and and wrote the first check and then now they sell to netflix like who makes out the most for going that big i don't know honestly i don't i'm, I'm not into the weeds that far but i know that uh Sender Films got a got a pretty big paycheck to make the film like bigger than they ever had in the past and then Red Bull had to figure out a way to recoup their investment and I I'm guessing that they were relatively successful in doing that. Yeah, I would think so. Well, they're they're yeah. extremely compelling. I I'd yeah. never seen yeah. a, a rock climbing documentary ever. That was the first one and then I watched like 5 Right. Because I was so like, this is so nice. compelling and exciting. Yeah. Um, uh, and the struggle and the, the, you know, the tension in the video. Yeah. I mean, like, cli climbing does make the really good stories. I think really that's one good thing. Stories. Yeah. There's so much heart and struggle and there's so many analogies uh, that people yeah, can do. My kids were enthralled by it. My yeah. kids had never watched documentaries and yeah. they're both just like, wow, yeah. this is so cool. So yeah. good job.
Yeah, good job, man. Cool. Well, thanks for coming on the show, Tommy. Yeah, thank you this guys. Been a great yeah, conversation. Yeah, yeah. Good time. Good to man. be here. Appreciate right it. On.